Um, I'm sure most of you know our guest tonight as a diplomat, a best-selling author, professor at Georgetown, and businesswoman. But there's one other fact about her that I'd like to mention. She first arrived in this country as a refugee, a refugee who fled her homeland to escape war and tyranny, a refugee who landed on American soil and into America's embrace, and who thanks to hard work, determination, and her unwavering belief in democracy, went on to become our nation's 64th Secretary of State. And, and let us not forget, she was also the first woman ever to hold that job. I, I mention this because it says a lot about what America has long stood for, and hopefully still does. It also says a lot about this wonderful and extraordinary woman and public servant. Madeleine Albright knows a thing or two about what it means to be free, and what it looks and feels like when freedom gets taken away. Her new book, it's her sixth, is appropriately titled, Fascism, A Warning. It is timely, and it's already generating great praise from across the political spectrum. Who better than Secretary Albright to raise alarm bells about the perils of demagogues and the dangers to democracies of leaders who assault trusted institutions and who show contempt for the rule of law? And who better to alert us to the risks of being complacent in response? Secretary Albright, if you've read her wonderful, wonderful memoir, actually two different memoirs that deal with this, uh, you know that she was still a child when her family was twice driven from its home in Czechoslovakia, first by the Nazis, then after World War II, by an aggressive communist regime. In 1948, her family came to the United States, where she finished her schooling, raised three daughters, two of whom are here tonight, along with two grandchildren, um, entered public service, and became one of the leading voices in shaping U.S. foreign policy. As America's ambassador to the United Nations and later as Secretary of State, she engaged regularly with dictators and autocrats. After leaving government, she's taught the next generation about foreign policy, led a global business, written more best-selling books, and is now chair of the National Democratic Institute, where she continues to fight for freedom, human rights, and the rule of law. In Fascism, a Warning, she draws on her personal and diplomatic experiences and examples of despots from the last century and now to explain why Americans in the Trump era shouldn't be lulled into a false confidence that the United States is immune to a disturbing worldwide trend. If you think it can't happen here, think again and read this book. It's a stern and urgent warning from one of our wisest and most respected American leaders. We're also delighted uh, to have a dear friend and one of our nation's most tal talented journalists here tonight to discuss fascism with Secretary Albright. Jeffrey Goldberg, editor-in-chief of The Atlantic, has reported from the most of the world's hotspots, including the Middle East, and I guess Washington now counts as a global hotspot. Um, in addition to The Atlantic, he has reported and written for The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, New York Magazine, and The Jerusalem Post, winning awards for his stories and for a book he published in 2006 called, six, called The Prisoners. It's about his experience as a guard at a prison camp in Israel. Many of you undoubtedly also remember Jeffrey's extraordinary, wide-ranging, and immersive interview for The Atlantic with President Obama before he left office. What a treat and an honor to have these two with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming Secretary Madeleine Albright and Jeffrey Goldberg. It's clearly going to be a tough crowd for you here. <laughs> I just want you to prepare yourself for that. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. But Lissa, thank you very much. Sixth and I, politics and prose. My colleagues from the Atlantic, thank you all for being here. Thank you, uh, Madeline, for, for being here. I have to tell you before we start, um, when I got here about a half hour ago, I, I walked into the green room. She was, Madeline was signing books. 
And I said, because I have a tendency to joke around, I said, what is this book called anyway? And she said, it's called Fashion, A Warning. Um, <laughs> Sort of an ultimate Gilda Radner moment or something like that. But we're, we're, we'll, we'll, we'll skip the fashion and go right to the fascism. Let's start um, with definitions, if we may. Um, define for us the, the characteristics of fascism. Give us a thumbnail sketch of what you mean when you use the word fascism. Well, first of all, let me just say how happy I am to be here and that I actually paid homage to you by writing about the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, uh, and um, then... We're, we're a fisheries uh, magazine, uh, actually. People don't know that. And Hugo Chavez talked about the fact that he enjoyed politics and prose. So okay. I have, uh, that's my way of thanking all of you. So thank you. I do think that one of the issues actually are what the definitions are. And fascism is not easy to define. Uh, it is basically a... Uh, a plot or a plan where, in fact, there is an identification with a tribe or a hyper-nationalism. Uh, it is uh, where, in fact, you decide that it is, um, you identify with that group, but you already discriminate against those that are not part of the group and don't care about their civil rights or liberties of any kind. It is a way to um, de uh, really deprecate and not pay any attention to any kind of uh, democratic institutions. It is how to use propaganda and information to put your message out and having rallies where, in fact, uh, you say terrible things about your opponent and you then also in, even encourage violence. You do also try to get all control of power, authority, and a certain amount of security or military around you. And you did never listen to anybody who disagrees with you. So that, but it is not an easy definite thing to define, frankly. We will get to the person a lot of us think you're talking about <laughs> in a, and by that I mean Vladimir Putin, obviously. Um, we'll get to that in a minute, and we want to work, work through these definitions with you. But I, I thought it would be interesting to start at the beginning, um, which is to say your own life and your own story. Um, didn't have an average childhood, you bumped up right against fascism in its purest form. And I, I want you to talk a little bit about um, your experiences as a child, your experiences through the prism of your parents, um, and what makes you think, based on what you saw then, that what we're seeing now around the world um, suggests that it's, it's having a resurgence. Well, first of all, um, I. You know, I was a very smart child, but at two, I didn't understand much. Um, what happened, I was Not even born written your in, first book in yet, uh, right, 1937, yeah. and the Munich Agreement happened in 1938, and the Nazis marched into Prague in March 1939. My father was a Czechoslovak diplomat, um, and uh, the government in exile was moving, and they went to London, and so my parents escaped with me um, at that time and lived in London. Uh, and um, I knew very little about my family uh, in, in many different ways. I, my, um, I have pictures of me with my grandparents, but I don't actually remember any of that. And then being in uh, England all through the war, and then when we came back to Czechoslovakia, I was eight years old, and I didn't know what grandparents were. I didn't remember anybody, and um, nobody was around. There was no family. Um, and then my father became ambassador to Yugoslavia. Um, and what happened is he had to leave again because the communists took over uh, Czechoslovakia. So that's twice the story. But I later found out, and I think there are a number of people here who know about this. I didn't know. I was raised a Catholic, married an Episcopalian, and found out I was Jewish. Uh, and so I have interfaith dialogues by myself. Welcome home, uh, by the way. You know, yeah. uh, but what I found out also, um, and my brother and sister are here, because at the time I had just been made Secretary of State when I found all this out, and I couldn't leave my job. And so they went to um, the Czech Republic and found an awful lot of things out about my family. And it does turn out, after a lot of research, that 26 members of our family were murdered in the Holocaust. And so 
facing fascism directly, um, and, but I, I learned all that later. And so basically, I think that it is a story where a country was sold down the river and Hitler always needed a scapegoat. And that is the kind of thing that we're looking at. You know, what is it that's happening? What kind of forces are there that makes this kind of thing happen? So before we come back to the American part of this story, let's talk about much of your book is, uh, is a tour of countries, many of which you know very well, um, in which democracy is either on its back foot or has been completely uh, obliterated. Uh, and the question is, and this is where you know, I want to be very careful, um, do you see uh, an analogous situation between the conditions in the world, I'm not just talking about here or in certain countries of Europe, but across the world, um, conditions analogous to the conditions that you studied of the 30s? Well, I, the, I particularly, this, a lot of this book is history, and it really goes back to looking at Mussolini and Hitler, but then spends time looking at what is going on now in Hungary, Poland, Turkey, Philippines, um, and in Venezuela, and several other countries as we kind of go around. And what one does see are some similarities, and that is um, a unhappiness among people over something to do with their economic condition or the fact that they, um, there's a minority in their country that they feel is, in fact, undermining the system. But mostly, it is just kind of trying to figure out how to run countries that are going through a lot of changes. That was true with Mussolini and what was happening in Italy. The part that truly blows my mind is that most of the countries that I've been studying, uh, the people were either elected or their, uh, their power was transferred constitutionally. And that the, the leaders that emerge take advantage of that kind of pressure from below. That's the part about fascism that's so interesting and, and so dangerous, is that it does come bottom up because there are people who feel that they've been discriminated against and technology has made them lose their jobs or something like that. And then there is a leader from above who takes advantage of that disquiet and makes it worse by, in fact, exacerbating the divisions in society and then says, I've got a solution for it. And we do see that in the countries that I've been looking at. So the obvious question for you is, is, is this. Secretary of State, in a period in which America and the democratic idea were, were, were clearly ascendant. I mean, we don't even have to go into Fukuyama and the end of history and, and, and to understand that um, the Soviet Union uh, had collapsed on itself. Um, there felt like there was a democratic wave. I, I'll ask you this in the context of a question that we often asked President Obama. President Obama had a fundamentally optimistic view of, of the nature of history, that, that the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice, to quote from King. Um, has your thinking over the past couple of years shifted about inevitability of democracy? Well, um, yeah, no, but I do think it, it shows, has shown me how difficult democracy is. And to go back a little bit in what you said, I do think that um, the story of my life was basically that Americans weren't there during Munich and terrible things happened. Then during the war when the Yanks showed up, I was a little girl and it was amazing and that's when I fell in love with Americans in uniform. Then what happened was that um, the, the, the war ended and Europe was divided as a result of agreements made between the Soviet Union and the United States and the part of the world and east of it uh, was behind the Iron Curtain. And so uh, for me, it was the question of what is America's role? When America is not present, terrible things happen. And when we somehow help, then better things happen. I could go through all that. So what I am, uh, so when the wall came down, and it was so interesting, Jeff, because I was able to do surveys all over Europe at the time, and uh, focus groups and attitude surveys, and people were literally euphoric about what had happened. And they just wanted to be Europeans. And it was, I had a great time because I was vice chair of the National Democratic Institute. I went to Prague with John McCain because he was head of the International Republican Institute. And there was this sense America could help in providing kind of the nuts and bolts of democracy. And they all seemed really ready to do it. 
I think now we keep, I've just had a discussion with some of my Czech friends, how did this happen? And I think some of it happened was because there were divisions in society and a lot of people were really desirous of being free and being able to think and do what they wanted to. But the bottom line is a lot of people were not gaining from what was going on. There was a lot of corruption going on. And so they, in many ways, wanted to go back to a safety net. And then they were, in fact, kind of promoted by people like uh, uh, Viktor Orban, who wanted to seize power for himself. But I think the issues are similar in terms of problems that were there, in terms of divisions caused by economic necessity um, and by certain aspects of the democratic systems being still too new and slow to deal with the problems. I, I want to come to America's role in the world, and we can talk about that in the context of uh, a particular dictator, Bashar al-Assad, and some of the events of the past week. But let me stay on this for one minute and, and come back to your optimism, your seemingly innate optimism. Um, I think a lot of people, maybe even in this room, um, believed five or ten years ago that history was an arrow flying forward. Um, it, the, the conditions you're describing in country after country um, resemble more conditions of the 1930s in Italy and Germany than they resemble the United States or Western Europe in the 90s. So I just want to press you on your optimism a little bit. I mean, are we in an endless cycle where we move democratic and then move anti-democratic? What is the role of technology in uh, accelerating a democratic decline? Well, let me I, just say, I went to college to Wellesley sometime between the invention of the iPad and the discovery of fire. But uh, <laughs> the bottom line is that uh, because one of the professors had done a trans uh, made a play out of Candide, we all had the motto, everything is for the best in this best of all possible worlds. And there really was this kind of sense that things were going to get better. That is how I grew up. I am an optimist who worries a lot. Um, and I am worried about the fact exactly what you're saying is that there are conditions out there that in fact provide the, the petri dish for something terrible to happen where in fact some of the definitions that I gave of fascism uh, would take hold. And that's why I worry a lot that, and by the way, there's this saying that we all know now, see something, say something, I've added to it, do something. And that's what I'm trying to do by writing the book. Well, let's go, let's go right at it. The conditions that you've studied across Europe, Asia, elsewhere, uh, places from the Hungary to the Philippines, do you see those conditions right now in America? The uh, preconditions for fascism. I, I do see some of the divisions that I think were um, evident in terms of a lot of people feeling that they have been uh, disenfranchised or have lost their jobs as a result of technology, that they haven't had the opportunity of an education that would teach them the new skills. And there is kind of this sense that is true in all the countries that we've been talking about, they need somebody to blame. Um, and so that was certainly true in Europe. There's always the scapegoat. Um, and I think the thing that's happening here, there are people that have been left out. Um, and so the idea is to blame the foreigners, uh, the immigrants. And so, and we're operating on the fear factor, which is another aspect of it, which is engendered by, um, this kind of sense that worse things are going to happen instead of having an optimistic view of things. But I do see some conditions. And by the way, I was planning to write this book no matter who'd gotten elected, because I really do think that there are certain aspects, not so much, some of the 30s, uh, where, and the 30s were difficult, obviously, but the interesting part, and FDR was attacked from the right and the left, but he was able to develop some kind of common ideas, centrist. And what I don't see now is this search for common ground. It is more like, um, you know, real divisions on the right and the left and the exacerbation uh, of the differences. You do something very clever in this book repeatedly um, in your history of the rise of Mussolini and Hitler. Every so often you'll drop in a little bit of an Easter egg. Um, you'll, you'll tell the reader, for instance, that Mussolini's motto, one of his mottos was, drain the swamp. Um, in Italian. 
in it, yeah, it sounds yeah, better in yeah. Italian. The, um, but there, there's a kind of indirection to what you do in there. It's not that indirect, but it's, 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 yeah, somewhat, the, yeah, the, it's somewhat indirect. But let's go, let's just go at the question. Is the, president, the current president of the United States a fascist, or is he someone with fascistic tendencies? He is not a fascist. I'm not calling him a fascist. I do think he's the least democratic president of modern history. What's the difference between a least democratic president and a president with fascistic tendencies? Well, I think that I'm, I'm trying to be really careful about it because there are certain of these tendencies that are out there, but a lot of it is based on the fact that his instincts are not democratic in terms of uh, what he's been saying about people like you, the press, um, and then also how he treats the judiciary, um, that he does, in fact, try to divide uh, us versus them. Um, and I think that there are various parts of it. But I, I don't, don't think that he is a fascist. I think that um, he is, however, got tendencies that make me very nervous, and so I prefer to call it undemocratic. Uh, okay, so let's treat you, we're all gonna treat you as a canary in the coal mine or a bellwether. What would he have to do for you to say, you know what, this guy's a fascist? Well, I, I mean, how far away are we? I mean, no, you must have, no, to borrow I an expression, a red line. Some of it is, um, I think, the willingness, how much violence is involved in it. The willingness to do anything to stay um, in power and really um, much more, uh, I don't want to give any advice here. Uh, you know, uh, I think that basically that's the part that, uh, and then kind of subjugating all the, um, all the various institutions that have to do d with democracy and undermining them. But mostly it's this kind of sense that not in not allowing any part of the institutional de democratic issues to work, um, and then a certain level of kind of a bully with an army, and I think that's the part that I'm worried about. Can you be, and I'm, I'm not asking this with snark, but can you be um, a fascist um, if you are incompetent at working the levers of government and power? <laughs> That may should be, I do the should I do the snarky version? I mean, that may be very hopeful. Well, go talk talk about this. Uh, <laughs> I I think that um, there is a question about that. I think the decision making process doesn't seem to work, and so, but I I am trying really here um, not to be um, crazy, uh, you know, alarmist. Though what I am doing is. This is, book is titled the way I wanted it to be, a warning. And I think that that is where we need to figure out what we can do. I kind of have my to-do list, um, which is that there needs to be an awful lot more public participation. I think we cannot allow um, the way that the press is being treated, and I have made a big point of that. We can't allow the things that are happening to the judicial branch. We cannot allow um, this kind of sense that uh, we, we can find people that, that, we can't operate on the basis of fear all the time. But the thing that we all have to do, those of us who care, actually have to do positive things, which is to run for office, uh, to support those who are, and not to care just about the federal government, but also um, mayors and local councils and, and state. And, uh, really push on. And then the other part, I have to say, we have to learn to listen to people we disagree with. Now, um, I would uh, like to warn you all that as I drive um, to work every morning, I do listen to right-wing radio, uh, and I yell and um, <laughs> give people the finger. And so... Um, you I know what you should do? You should call in. That I, would be well, surprising. That would freak them out. Uh, but I do think one has to listen um, and also try to, to listen to people you disagree with. I think that part is very important. And then I have been so moved by literally the children who marched and who um, um, want gun sanity so that they don't have to wear flak jackets to school. And so I think more activism is what we need to do, um, and, I, and that is we, we have to guard against this happening. And then the other part is we cannot have scapegoats. 
That is one of the aspects. The Hungarian, uh, Viktor Orban doesn't like immigrants. Uh, the Poles don't either. Um, and just generally, we, we can't blame others for issues that have something to do with the fact that the social contract in many ways is broken down and people are left out. I want to come back to the question that you've cleverly alighted uh, so far, um, which is the red line, the red line issue. Well, let, me, let me make it easier. If the president fires Mueller or Rosenstein, would that cause you to think, you know what? This guy has, I don't want to use the word fascist, but that he has actual fascistic tendencies. Well, one of the things that I haven't really mentioned um, specifically on purpose, which is that one of the, the uh, uh, real uh, signs, symptoms, is contempt for thinking that you're above the law. Um, and I think that is something that, if that happens, that that is something very much to worry about. But the bottom line is, if he does that, I think in many ways, that will make people realize that he's gone too far. Um, but, I do, I, but I do think that that then energizes people and should energize all of us to actually be much more forthright in pushing people to run. And there are elections coming up. And one of the things that I think is really important, and by the way, you know, in my role as chairman of the National Democratic Institute, I go to countries to observe elections, and people stand in lines in the rain and the heat for the privilege of voting. And we are doing something that is unacceptable, is normalizing what is going on now. Um, and not thinking that we have any power, and our power is through voting and running for office. The, um, there's an interesting aspect to the phenomenon of Trump that I don't think we talk about enough, which is that this wouldn't be possible without the acquiescence and support of the structures of one of the two major political parties. Um, you are a well-known centrist. Centrist suggests that you had an easy time, or as a, at least a goal, of working with moderates from the other side. Um, and so my question, obviously you had a close, have a close relationship with John McCain and others. My question for you is, is this, and this I'm asking you is almost to analyze, um, what do you think happened in the Republican Party um, that weakened the immune system to the point where um, this person became the flag bearer for a major American political party? I think nobody believed that this could happen. I think any of us that watched when there were all those Republican candidates up there that they would let this happen. And I think that what is going on, which I find very troubling, is the fact that there is not a pushback by what I call decent Republicans. Senator McCain is certainly doing everything he can, and a few others are, but that they are seeing their party, uh, the party of Abraham Lincoln, really destroyed. And some of it is because they're afraid about their own election prospects. But what is fascinating are the number of, of members that are decided not to run which is interesting, but not particularly helpful. Uh, what needs to happen is somebody um, has to run in their place and not, in fact, some far-right Freedom Party person. But I, I do think, you know, I do believe in bipartisanship. I had to in order to work with Jesse Helms. But the bottom line is we actually managed to do some things together. And I do believe that that's important. And frankly, you know what's so interesting? There's really been a problem with the State Department budget and support for democracy. And I've spent a lot of time on the Hill, and there are Republicans that want to help. And I have said also, Constitution Article I is about the power of Congress. It's Article I time, and they have to stand up and do something. Have you ever met Donald Trump? Pardon? Have you ever met Donald Trump? No. Would you like to meet no. Donald Trump? I really would not. Um, I could, Why? Because I, I have nothing to say to him. Do you think that he has the capacity to learn? Do you think that he has no. the capacity to understand? I do not, frankly. And that's the sad part, because I have worked for a lot of political people, uh, starting with Ed Muskie and a lot of different people, and they all had the capacity to learn and to understand that 
Um, there are things that are a little bit different than they thought, and listen to others. Um, and, and I think, and I don't get that feeling at all about Trump. You write about a, a, a large range, and I want to come to the North Korean and the Syrian situation, but you write about a, long, a, a large range of, of foreign despots you've met uh, over the years, um, foreign leaders you've met. I'm curious if you can, it, it, we all do this in our minds, we compare people to people we've met. Um, who, who in the panoply of leaders you've met um, did Donald Trump remind you of? But that is nobody particularly. I, I mean, not, no, not a Victor no, Orban, very, not, a, not a populist, no, uh, European no. populist. What I find very interesting, actually, Victor Orban was a very interesting character that I met in 1986. He, you met him when he was a good guy. When he was a good guy. By the way, George Soros funded his education at Oxford. Um, and he also was really, uh, he found, uh, Orban started a party of youth, Fides. As he got older, it got to be an old party. But the bottom line is he was an interesting guy that was trying to sort out what to do in Hungary after all that time in communism. The question is what happened to him? And, but he's very smart and um, educated in a number of different ways and I think not kind of off the top of his head, uh, something fluky that happens. And I truly can't think of anybody of these particular leaders that is um, as uh, undisciplined um, as, as Trump. I think that is his, his major issue. By the way, today was, uh, Alyssa was very kind to introduce me about all these firsts. So I was the first woman um, Secretary of State, and I was the first Secretary of State to go and visit Kim Jong-il in North Korea. Today I had another first. Um, I was uh, with Jake Tapper on CNN, and we were talking about sanctions against Russia and various things, and all of a sudden he said, thank you very much and he, they do breaking news, and it's the first time that I have been interrupted by a porn star. Yeah. Muzzle tough. <laughs> it's, a, it's a rare achievement. The, um, you've introduced a new subject, which is the way I'd feel less abashed if we weren't sitting immediately in front yeah, of the Torah, by yes. the way. <laughs> I was thinking whether that was appropriate in the setting. No, but, but everything that's going on is not necessarily yeah. appropriate. We have to still talk about it. Talk about America's role in the world right now. Um, you know, you, you have, you've had problems with Barack Obama's foreign policy. You had problems with George W. Bush's foreign policy. You had problems with foreign policies across the, the spectrum. Uh, we all sense that something is different right now. It, talk about this in the frame of American indispensability. Uh, have we ceased to be, or are we ceasing to be, the indispensable nation that you've talked yeah. about? Well, let me just say, my whole life, as I've said, has been based on America being present and doing something. And um, when I went to the United Nations in 93, um, and President Clinton had a different view of what we needed to do, but the thing that was happening, a lot of um, things that had to be done domestically because he felt that not enough had been done by the previous administration, so it was the economy stupid, and there was really a question about what our role was going to be internationally. And he's the one that first used the term indispensable, I just used it so often, it became identified with me, but there's nothing about the word indispensable that says alone. It means that we need to be engaged, and we need to be engaged because it's good for America. Um, and so what happened, um, by the way, Americans don't like the word multilateralism. It has too many syllables and it ends in an ism. Uh, but it only means partnership. And so what we saw during the Clinton administration was American engagement with others in order to try to deal with the kinds of issues that had plagued the world during World War II. Deliberately, um, one could say, um, I certainly wouldn't anymore, that we didn't know what was happening during World War II. But all of a sudden, we knew everything that was happening in the Balkans, for instance, and how to figure out, in partnership with others, to do something about it. And that's now the question. What is America's role in the world? And the hardest part, Jeff, is the following, is that it used to be 
that American presidents and American secretaries of state would go to a country, even where we disagreed with the leader, and talked about human rights and democracy um, and made our points clear. And now we don't do that. And therefore, some of these people feel um, that they have the liberty to go ahead and undermine democracy. Does the fact that so many Americans apparently uh, uh, apparently have ceased to believe in indispensability as a project or, or America's presence in the world as a, a positive, ameliorative uh, aspect of global affairs, does that reflect poorly on the establishment, the foreign policy establishment here in Washington, the, the establishments of the two parties? Well, I think that there's a reason for different things, and part of, partially, I do think the war in Iraq was one of the biggest mistakes the United States had made. And President Obama was elected to get us out of that. Um, and I think there is kind of a sense of why are we involved in a variety of places. And I talk about something called the Karzai effect. President Karzai of Afghanistan not only did not thank us or be grateful for the fact that people died um, and that we spent a lot of money there, he actually said it was all our fault that things were screwed up. So why would we want to help places um, that Americans are the most generous people in the world with the shortest attention span and also want to have somebody say thank you. And so I can understand what has happened here and that we have to worry about ourselves because the infrastructure doesn't work. But what you need is a president that can explain the relationship between our position in the world and our health at home. But I think you're saying that some of Trump's instincts might actually be correct, or at least rooted in some kind of reality, a reality that Americans feel uh, that they're not thanked for all of the sacrifices that Americans have made. Is that fair? I, I do. I mean, I think he has, that's why I said some of it is bottom up, that then there's a leader who can take advantage of it. And what you need to do is have people that can explain why we need to, we don't have to be everywhere, and we don't have to do everything alone, but I think the world can't function without American leadership. And the thing that drives me crazy is Trump making us seem like victims. You know, America has just been taken advantage of all the time. Um, all these foreigners are coming. Um, dreadful things are happening. The scapegoat part. And not that leadership that understands that America does need to be engaged. The, um, uh, one more question. We're going to take questions in a few minutes, and there's two mics set up here. You don't have to move quite yet, but there are mics here for questions. Um, the, uh, let's talk about the events, the very dramatic events of, of the weekend. Um, and I don't mean Michael Cohen, I mean the, something that's much more important, um, which is the destruction of Syria. You are, you'll probably not cotton to this word necessarily, but you are known as a bit of an interventionist. Bosnia forward. Um, you disagreed with President Obama's decision not to bomb the Syrian chemical munitions factories and, and sites when that was an issue in, in that administration. Um, your, uh, do you have words of praise for Donald Trump for enforcing a red line established by President Obama? Um, I am very, I think it was right to respond, but the bottom line is there's no strategy. We have no idea where this is going, and kind of one-offs are not a good idea. Uh, and I think that the complete disarray of the decision-making process has been shown over this weekend, um, where, according to what I've read, um, they couldn't make up their mind um, in terms of what option to take and a number of different things. John Bolton was there for three days, um, and various problems to do with that. Then trying to figure out what to do about Russia. What happened today on Russia and the sanctions is one of the most ridiculous things I have ever seen where the president has undermined his United Nations ambassador who has really been doing a very kind of stalwart job in talking about what Russia She's an old-fashioned McCain-style Republican from your perspective. Is that fair to say, Nikki Haley? I, 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 I'm not sure I can categorize her, but I really do think I didn't like some of the things she said when she first went to the UN and said we're taking names about who's on our side or not. But I have been in those councils where the Russians are pushing us around, um, and I think she's been very strong about what needs to be done and about the sanctions. And all of a sudden, she says they're going to be sanctioned. Then all of a sudden, the president says, I don't think so. 
I mean, aside from making her look bad um, and undercutting the highest level at the moment um, person in diplomacy, she's a cabinet member and an ambassador, and so, um, and then also, one of the problems is that the signals that Trump gives generally abroad, I, I travel abroad, and many of us do, but as a former diplomat, you're not supposed to criticize your own country. It's impossible to explain what Trump is doing um, and trying to explain to uh, allies and adversaries. Maybe this is just the crazy Nixon approach. No, it's too, well, you can be crazy a little bit, uh, the crazy Nixon approach, but not permanently crazy. And I think that it truly undermines what is going on. And we need allies and friends, but if you're constantly mixing signals, um, you're in trouble. And then if for some reason, he is really uh, gives Putin a very wide berth, um, and he's kind of apologetic for how many diplomats were kicked out, and now he changes his mind on something, it does give kind of sustenance to the idea that the Russians do have something on him. Yeah. Let me ask people who do have questions to come to the, to the mics, and let me ask you this one final question. I mean, I have a, there's a million questions, and I hope some people will get to them. Uh, you have a really good finger feel, a good sense of people with non-democratic values, non-democratic tendencies. Uh, and you have a very good, after years of diplomacy, you have a very good sense of motivation. Um, can you explain or tell us what you think is going on in the relationship between Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump? I can, uh, no. Uh, uh, I mean, I... Let me rephrase it in a way no, that no, brings let me, us let to me yes. Just say the following thing. I met Putin the first time when he was still acting president um, at an apex summit where he was trying to be very ingratiating with everybody. Then we had the summit in Moscow, and what was very clear to me was that he was very smart um, and tough in so many different ways. He is a KGB agent. That is what we have to remember, and he has played a weak hand very well. I think that um, I cannot understand what it is that Trump sees in him, which makes me think that there are some other things going on in terms of what is being investigated. And the fact that Trump is not capable of looking into what the Russians did during the elections here and what they clearly have done in Europe because he's concerned about the legitimacy of his election is definitely thinking that he's above the law. And that's what worries me because, and that's why we have to be very vigilant about the elections, the midterm elections, and then the presidential elections, because Putin is capable, he has um, um, really militarized information and is using asymmetrical warfare now, and I think somebody needs to make clearer to Trump what is going on, and that this does not have to do with his legitimacy. This has to do with undermining democracy, which is why I've said the things I did about not having democratic instincts. Thank you. And if you can do us all a favor and put these questions in the form of a question, that would be great. Um, as a student of American foreign policy history, uh, I believe that it is you who famously said something along the lines of, we have this marvelous army, Mr. President, why don't we use it? I think in regards to the Balkan situation in the 90s. And since I read about that, I've wanted to pick your brain a little bit about how your view has either changed or not changed in light of 9-11 and the authorization of use of military force and the unilateral actions by presidents to, I mean, we saw it this past weekend in Syria, and I just wanted to know how your views have changed or not. Well, I, I teach a course, and I say foreign policy is just trying to get some country to do what you want. So what are the tools? And even though we're the most powerful country in the world, there are not a lot of tools in the toolbox, and you have to use them. And we, I was talking about the Balkans, and we had used diplomacy and um, economic and smart sanctions and a variety of things. And I do think that there is a time that one needs to use force. I have just had a class where I've been talking about humanitarian intervention. And the number of times that we get blamed for not doing anything in Rwanda 
uh, and then blaming people for doing something somewhere else, these are damned if you do, damned if you don't situations. And I think we have to figure out how you use the toolbox, and I am not opposed to using force if you've tried diplomatic tools and if you actually have a strategy. And so, um, and we did not operate in um, Kosovo and Bosnia unilaterally. We did it with others, so that's my explanation. But I do think it's one of those damned if you do, damned if you don't, and what are the responsibilities that we have to each other. So you say in this book that fascism, um, and I've heard George Mitchell say similarly, um, any kind of extremism, it, it appeals to groups of people that are disenfranchised, who feel victimized by either the economy, some sort of being left behind. And you say that we should run for office and that we should uh, replace the leaders that we have now, and I agree, but it doesn't change the fact that there are still tens of millions of people that, are, that feel victimized and disenfranchised. And it, it seems to me that what we need is a... Uh, Can you have a question, please? Uh, yes, what we need is a leadership of, um, th to replace the vacuum, something on the positive side, to give people that hope and that sense of belonging. So what ideals do you see that we could mobilize and unify, not along political lines, but really along um, uh, ideal lines. How can we offer the alternative to fascism? What are the ideals we should well, base that on? Well, first of all, I do think the government has responsibilities towards the people. Uh, I believe in government, and I do think that what needs to happen is to focus on what the problem is. Some of it has to do with jobs and not having the education to deal with the new jobs. We also need to have education that provides civics so that people understand the responsibilities of uh, being a citizen. But for me, the answer is figuring out what the issue really is, whether it is that the water is poisoned in Flint or various things that have to have some, pa some resolution by various forms of government. Uh, and not to see the government as the enemy, but to use it and we actually pay taxes because that is the price of living in a civilized country, and that's what the taxes should be for. Hi, Madam Secretary. Thank you so much for your service and your continued service to the country. I was just wondering, given the reports of low morale at the State Department, what general guidance you might be able to offer for current civil and foreign service officers, and if he hasn't already spoken to you, uh, Mike Pompeo. Well, I, I am uh, so appalled by what's happened to the State Department, and one of the things that um, I've done is spend a lot of time on the Hill, as I said, and trying to uh, explain that if you're going to do diplomacy, you need diplomats, um, and that also the people that have worked in the State Department, the Foreign Service officers and the civil servants, are patriotic Americans. And just because they work for a different administration, doesn't mean that they are not supportive. When I, I was so sorry, I loved being Secretary of State, by the way, uh, and I was very jealous of the people that were able to stay. The issue for them is they do have to work for different administrations. Um, I do think the one, I listened to some of uh, Pompeo's uh, hearings, and I was very encouraged by the fact that he wanted to resurrect the State Department and that he was really going to work on it. Um, I think we need to, should he get confirmed, I think we really need to hold him to that. And the part that I'm very upset about, I do teach at Georgetown School of Foreign Service, and there are a lot of young people that don't know whether they should go into the government and whether they should take the Foreign Service exams, and what's happening is we're cutting off the pipeline. So I think we have a longer term problem, and I'm going to keep arguing for doing something more to bring the State Department back. Could I, um, a very quick intervention here, and just ask you, I recognize the implausibility of what I'm about to suggest to you, but what if the phone rang one day in the near future, and it was Mike Pence, and he said, Madam Secretary, we are trying to deal with North Korea, you have a lot of experience on this, would you please come in and talk to the President about this? This goes to the subject of service. Would you do it? Actually, about North Korea, I would because I do think the part that is very important, the Clinton administration, we spent a great deal of time studying North Korean policy. Uh, President Clinton had asked former Secretary of Defense Bill Perry 
to kind of relook at what we were doing. Uh, we spent time, he went there, I, and, but the lesson that I would make clear to them is you have to prepare. There has to be a lot of work on diplomatic preparation. And this goes to the last question, because the person in the State Department that was doing North Korea left, uh, and we have no ambassador uh, in South Korea. And so, yes, I would do that. Uh, Madam Secretary, I have two questions. One is easy and one is hard, and I'll let you decide which is which. My first question concerns Russia. I understand a lot about a lot of countries, but Russia to me is still what Churchill said about being an enigma. They adopted virtually everything that the West invented, and they, they improved upon it. They have the best dancers and choreographers and writers and philosophers and scientists, but somehow they missed the boat on the two most important things, which are government and business. Is there an explanation for that? And the second question is, you have traveled probably more than anyone, and I'm just wondering what you think are the two prettiest large and small cities in Europe? <laughs> uh, I'll answer both, but let me just say this. I used to be known as a Soviet expert, and I look at my library and I think, archeology, span actually not. There's an awful lot that's there that's similar to what the czars did and also what communists did. Um, and I was ta talking about this attitude survey that I took in 91, and we did focus groups everywhere. And what happened, I'll never forget the one outside of Moscow, where this man stands up and says, I'm so embarrassed. We used to be a superpower, and now we're Bangladesh with missiles. So this country had kind of lost its identity, and what has happened is Putin has identified himself with the return of this greatness. Most people that study the Soviet Union or Russia, we all have kind of a love-hate relationship in terms of admiring the music and the dancers and the literature, but there is something about a, a country that can't uh, accommodate itself to the international system in any way. So, uh, but Russia is fascinating. They have taken our best things and they're trying to undermine democracy. That is what Putin is doing. He is a KGB officer, as I mentioned. So the most beautiful city? I'm Prague, obviously. Yeah. Uh, um, and the only other, when we ended up in Denver, my mother said there are only two great cities in the world, Prague and Denver. So I have to stick with that. Thank you. Actually, I was thinking Prague, but if you've never been to Chesky Krumlov, Yes, like that. that is a beautiful place too. But Istanbul is great, though after this book, I think I won't be invited to visit. <laughs> go ahead. I, I want to go back to, to Europe as well. And, and you talked a lot about Orban and Hungary and, and to some extent Poland. Um, do you believe that the EU can do anything about these two situations? And secondly, since you talked about scapegoating, are you worried about sort of the rise of anti-Semitism in Europe? Let me just say, the European Union was really created in order to avoid the hyper-nationalism that got us into World War II. And there really was the sense that there was a possibility, some of them even looked at the United States and thought the United States of Europe. What is fascinating about it is that it is part of the problem now, because it is faceless and people attack a lot the faceless bureaucrat in Brussels, and therefore this nationalism has arisen again in these countries because they think that Brussels isn't doing anything. The part that's interesting, and some of us that have studied international organizations, you would think that one of the most democratic things is to have decisions by consensus. The problem now is that you've got two countries, Hungary and Poland, that are not doing what is part of the the whole concept of the European Union. And although the um, Brussels wanted to do something about Poland um, in sanctioning it, what happened is the Hungarians had their back and vice versa. So there has to be some rethinking of how it operates, but there is a genuine problem, which is the facelessness of globalization um, and, and organizations and people losing their identity and we do all want to have an identity, whatever it is. Um, but if my identity hates your identity, 
then it's very dangerous, which leads to the question that you um, asked in the end is, I do think there's anti-Semitism as well as anti-Muslimism um, in Europe, and there is this kind of return to ethnic purity, and that is the scapegoat. So that's one of the signs that I think one has to look for. Thank you. I think I'm too short for this. Um, Madam Secretary, thank you so much for being such a great role model to so many of us. I brought my 13-year-old son here today with me. Um, you know, one of the things I want to ask you is this. Um, I come from a Muslim family. I'm a first-generation immigrant in this country. Um, and what I tend to see is that we have, you know, tri uh, tribal biases going on or partisan politics going on where we want to point to the other party and say, hey, they've got fascist tendencies. They're doing this and they're doing that. But, you know, I also noticed some fascist tendencies in the last administration, right? I noticed the Espionage Act being used against journalists. I, I noticed unaccompanied minors being locked up in detention centers and stuff. Don't you think that, you know, if we really want to be progressive as a human society, as, we, as a society of American citizens, don't you think we should be calling out our own faults as well and stopping them before they grow into this bigger problem because some maniac or somebody that we can't control has taken the help? I think that we have to, what I don't want to do is discriminate against people just because they are of a particular religion or have come in here as refugees or immigrants. I do think that we need to obviously be concerned about people that are crazy uh, and are not, and various things that have been happening here. But I do think that also means a government and people that have a certain understanding of the makeup of this country and not to just decide that uh, there are people coming in that are trying to destroy us. And I think that's the issue. But this is very difficult. And what has been the greatness of America has been the capability of adapting to diversity and respecting people's different views. But it, we are in a very complex time. And the question is whether when there's some nutcase that does something, how that is dealt with, and that whether the governmental structures are really dealing with the issues that we have. They are complicated. There's no question. And as I said, I was going to write the book no matter what. Right. So that's why I think we all need to look at the complicated questions that you asked. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so the history that you're talking about, a lot, of, a lot of it took place during the Cold War. And even if it is not repeating itself now, there's a lot of echoes of that period now. And if we don't end up with a bipolar world, but it's a tripolar world, some of the decisions we made during that Cold War involved us making strategic decisions to have form relationships with the same type of authoritarians and anti-democratic forces for strategic purposes for our, what seemed at that time to be the right idea. If we find ourselves in this situation in the future, would you have us rethink our relationship to some of these petty fascists in smaller uh, countries or is there a distinction between an authoritarian that we can have a relationship, strategic relationship with and one who is a, d a danger to democracy? I, I have to say that this is one of the most complex kinds of issues in terms of, um, you know, the, the whole question about whether American policy is idealistic or realistic. Um, and I always think it's kind of a false dichotomy because I never knew whether I was a pragmatic idealist or an idealistic pragmatist. And I do think that there are times that one makes compromises in terms of dealing with one group in order to deal with a larger evil. Um, and there was really very much of a sense of what communism was, um, and so there were some mistakes made, but there really was the sense that we had relationships with some fairly uh, discredited characters. I think that we need to sort out exactly who we need as friends and allies to deal with something that doesn't totally exist. I'm not saying that all these countries are fascist. They are basically have all these tendencies, and nothing will ever be as bad as Hitler. But I do think we need to figure out in a uh, cooperative way who, with whom we can work in order to not let these tendencies go forward and realize that there are problems that need to be dealt with by international approaches. Climate change, for instance, which is one of the causes of a lot of migrants, uh, or trying to sort out 
how to deal with poverty as people cross borders all the time. So I think that there will be those who will say, you should never deal with somebody that's impure. But I happen to be pragmatic enough to be able to see that there are sometimes advantages to getting help against a greater evil. Thank you. Yeah. We have time for two more questions. Okay. Um, as has been alluded to a little bit today, uh, you are about to be the second highest ranking U.S. official to be with a uh, leader of North Korea. Um, and I'd be curious to know both your expectation of the upcoming Trump Kim summit, as well as given all of the various variables involved, uh, what your expectation or what the best case scenario of that summit is. Um, well, I do think, as I said earlier, there has to be some preparation, but I think part of the issue here is even definitional uh, because what does denuclearization really mean to us and what it means to the North Koreans? So I think that is one of the aspects that has to be looked at and there has to be verification. The question is, what, how is this meeting even gonna take place and what the preparation for it will be? And I think that uh, somebody has to make clear to the president that he has to be very disciplined about this um, and not just kind of say things off the top of his head. And the hope would be is usually you actually don't have a meeting at this level until there have been other meetings. Um, by the way, when I went, what had happened was that the number two guy, Vice Marshal Cho, had come to the US and we were in the Oval Office when he gave the invitation to President Clinton. And he said, well, maybe at some point, but this has to be prepared, I'm sending the Secretary of State. Um, and given all the comings and goings of Secretaries of State in this administration, that is hard. But I think that since this meeting is taking place, I think it has to be fairly limited with instructions in order for there to be a lot more preparation on what the definition of denuclearization is um, and how the verification processes will begin and to get and recognize that this is not going to be solved overnight. Thank you, Madam Secretary. You mentioned those who feel victimized by fear as well as the leaders who take advantage of that. Um, you also mentioned Russia's systematic disinformation campaign against both our elections and those in Europe. Um, and you also mentioned our short attention span. Um, I'm wondering, in your opinion, what you think democracies can do not only to combat against the leaders who would take advantage of that systematic fear and victimization amongst their own populace, but um, that kind of outside pressure from a state which seeks to input its own will upon a democracy and trying to dismantle it even? Well, I think that partially, and this, this is not simple, because basically the Russians are really good at propaganda. Um, and they are using, in fact, the instruments that we all have put forward um, in terms of using the media and a lot of other aspects, which means, and this is the hard part, is um, providing the people in those societies um, a way to figure out what they're really listening to um, and, what, and how they are being influenced by it. And basically, we used to do pretty well um, with public diplomacy and also uh, having, um, I'm obviously gonna talk about the National Democratic Institute and the Republican Institute, of people going into these countries and being able to talk to them about what the elements of democracy are. However, that's all made much more complicated recently, but I, I do think it's basically giving people there an understanding that they are being duped uh, by the information that they're getting. And the other part that's the problem, when our president talks about fake news, it then makes it possible for Putin to talk about fake news and that he's providing the right news. And so I, I have to say, and I don't want to end it on this note, we are living in an incredibly complicated time where the kind of answers that we thought we had are not working completely. And therefore, it goes back to my to-do list. We cannot just leave it to our government uh, to make this happen. And we need to, I want to see more exchanges with people. I want to see uh, young people from the countries operating together. 
a sense that we can combat a lot of this is going on, but it's not going to happen overnight. And we have to also make clear uh, that the issues of having disenfranchised people in a number of places is what is creating this Petri dish. And I don't have all the answers, definitely, as you can tell. But I decided to write this book because I am concerned, and it is a warning, and I think that what I want to see all of us being much more active in this country and not being embarrassed about the fact that we believe in democracy and people having the right to choose the governments that they want. Madam Secretary, thank you very, very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.